Exodus, a new narrative and choice heavy first person RPG, was just recently announced at the Game Awards. And while we don't have a release date yet, their website does give quite a bit of information about the game and paints a pretty detailed setting for the game's story. So let's break down everything from the prologue stories and what it could mean for the world of Exodus. There are four chapters that have four small videos that accompany them, and they paint a pretty vivid picture of the game's setting and what Earth looked like before humanity was forced to flee. According to the Exodus timeline, around 2200 AD, Earth was infected by some kind of technovirus called the rot, and the rot was killing the planet. So during this time, humans started planning their escape with the intent to leave Earth and find habitable worlds elsewhere. Arcs were created, and some were owned by the government and some were privately owned. And in the prologue stories, we see the perspective of four different arcs. At this time, global resources were sparse, and a lot of these arcs seemed to suffer from proper spare parts to fix issues, and every arc was getting about half of what it needed to have the best chance at a safe journey. And of course, rich people weren't included in this scenario because the rich can afford every luxury and this was reflected in the arcs. There were also people stealing and selling these limited resources. And that brings us to the first prologue story. This story titled That'll Do is about a man named Torrance and Torrance was on an arc named Tamerlane. And while the overall story is about Torrance selling parts to a black market, the most interesting aspect of the story is a pig, more specifically, an awakened pig. Doris, a very large pig, was a member of the Tamerlane crew. She even wears her own uniform. And what's most interesting about Doris is that she can talk, and she does. She tells her fellow crew member that Torrance is stealing resources. And not only does she reveal what Torrance has been up to, Doris can smell Torrance's fear when confronted. During the confrontation between Doris, her crew member Brody, and Torrance, Torrance pulls out a ceramic gun that he was able to hide when he is cornered regarding his stealing. And before he could even react, Doris bites off his hand at the wrist. She lunged at him with the speed of a serpent and ate his hand. She has jagged tusk and super speed and super strength. And that's the end of the short story. The video that accompanies it talks about domesticating animals in the past tense. So while I think the short story may be from when the arcs were in transit, I wonder if this is the beginning of when pigs were first awakened. The context of the video introduces Charlotte, the first awakened pig. And the video itself seems like it's this company, Awakened Technologies Corporation, trying to advertise their technology of unlocking animals' potential, aka awakening them. When our ancestors first domesticated animals, they had very specific purposes in mind as food sources, labor animals, or doting companions. But as our society faces the reality of a dying earth, the role of domestic animals in our lives could be so much more. Meet Charlotte, the first of her kind, an awakened domestic pig. With our revolutionary biotech, she is an example of how we might unlock the cognitive potential of our animal companions and enhance their natural abilities. Charlotte may be the first of her kind, but she won't be the last. And there's a few other awakened animals that are mentioned as well in the other short stories, which I'll get into later. But the entire premise of animals we know in our world becoming more advanced and essentially living alongside us is a really fascinating sci-fi concept to explore and something I think could really set this game apart. We have an octopus doctor, a security guard pig, and a technician repair raccoon. If this is actually featured as a concept in the game and we either get awakened animals as companions or inhabitants on our ship, I would never stop playing this game. So I really do hope this is giving some clues to some aspects of the game we can look forward to. I think this could really set Exodus apart if they lean into this as a feature. One of the major highlights of Baldur's Gate 3 is being able to talk and interact with every single animal you meet. And I'd love to see this explored in a sci-fi setting as well. 
The next story, Inheritance, is about Edith and Lena. Edith is an engineer helping to finish work on the Ark, the Northern Bullet. And something very interesting about this Ark is that not only was it developed by humans, but there were also 50 awakened and half a thousand robots that helped finish the construction. At the time of this story, there were only 67 vessels slash arcs currently under construction on Earth, in orbit, on floating ocean dockyards, on the moon and on Mars. So this adds some additional context to the overall setting of the world of Exodus. At the time of the rot, roughly 200 years from our current time, we were living alongside robots and awakened animals. And not only that, but we had already inhabited Mars and the moon. And at this time, the rot was forcing everyone to flee. So this story is about Edith who helped design the entropy drive which is how these arcs are able to travel faster than anything in the universe except light. With this new technology, they'd hope only a few generations of humans would have to spend their time in space while waiting to find a new habitable planet, instead of waiting thousands of generations. This story also gives a little bit more context into how life on the arcs worked. There would be several sleeping people on board in cryosleep, while the actual crew lived and died on the ship. The crew members would be living full lives and having kids, while those kids then went on to live their own lives. All while the people in cryo remained asleep, waiting to arrive at their new home. And while this particular arc was being made, their new home of Alpha Centauri had already been chosen as their destination. Edith's reward for working on this drive was that she got a spot in one of the cryo beds aboard the arc. But the story and the accompanying video show that Edith was in poor health. And at the end of the story, she gives Lena, her daughter, her spot on the Ark. The video to the story also adds more additional context to the Arks. First off, the Arks weren't that big. There were so many of them because they could only hold a few thousand people on board. And it seems like the Northern Bullet was being told to increase its capacity to 2,200, which seems like it was a strain on the project. Edith talks about needing more time to make this happen. And the rest of the clip is Edith getting her test results regarding her worsening health condition. And there's two reasons why I think this story could be important. First off, the video has this data pad, which looks like it belonged to Edith. And it looks like it could be in a museum or some type of observatory. So I wonder if these are old pieces of the past that have been kept by these future generations of humans. I say this because the screen on this data pad looks fractured and broken at the bottom. So I wonder if this was something left behind that had been found long after these events took place. I also wonder if Lena, Edith's daughter from the story, will turn out to be a companion or maybe some kind of relevant character we meet in game. Maybe she's a human who went on to become part of the celestial lineage, one of the first humans that established themselves in the Centauri cluster, Maybe she's someone who is still in cryosleep and no time has really passed for her. Either way, I think she could still be a relevant character. The third story, titled 99% Workable, is about Jurgen Berendown, who is the billionaire financer behind the arc Fortunate Son. And this story sets up rich assholes doing what they do best, thinking they're better than everyone else. Essentially, Baron Down is hosting a party to celebrate the launch of his arc, The Fortunate Son. He invites 39 of the most influential people in the world, which is really just 39 more rich assholes. Except two, the first one, Alania Mars, a musician that he invited out of pity and as a way to feel better about doing some kind of sympathy invite. She was his charity case. He had planned on using her whenever he wanted, letting her stay in cryo until he wanted to dethaw her. The next non-billionaire was Mariette, who he matched with on this dating app and had intended to make her work for her spa on the Ark. As soon as Baron Down is done reveling in his good deed, he goes to announce and showcase the departure of the fortunate son to his 39 guest. Him and his guests were located in the executive model, which was all glam and money. There was a pool, grand bedrooms, fully stocked with toys, and even a golf course. This arc was about luxury and not quantity. In his mind, he was preserving what made humanity great instead of preserving humanity. He was interested in preserving the billionaire dynasties and music and literature, but not the actual people. He thought he had it all. 
as he gathered his party to watch the Fortunate Sons launch, the screen turned on a view of the cockpit. Inside was Ganelon Liao, his captain, his crew, Alania, the musician, and Mariette, the woman who he had paid to escort him, the one he intended to make work for her spot on the Ark. Baron Down then realized that all of the human staff were no longer found amongst his guests, and that only robots remained. Finally, the fortunate son took off, and Baron Down watched as the ship departed, but he was not on it. The Ark didn't bring the executive module, with its billionaire dynasties and luxuries, it took only the crew and the staff. The Habitat module was a built living space for 3,960 people. Liao and his crew had built this ship using Baron Down's money and built it right under his nose. The perfect ending to this story. And I do think this goes to show a really interesting aspect of the real world. Because if our current society suffered this same fate, we would see these exact same situations with the rich versus the poor when it came to self-preservation. And I think this paints an interesting picture of what society would be like in this situation. And I do wonder if we'll see these three characters again. Obviously, Baron Down was left on Earth, but the Captain Liao, the singer Alania, and the escort Mariette all made it out alive. And this video associated with this story is probably the most interesting one next to the video about Charlotte. Again, we see another data pad with cracks all along the screen. So again, I wonder if there's some kind of relic in a museum or some long lost item of the past. In the beginning of the messages in the video, we see a conversation between the captain and Baron Down. The captain wanted to stretch the supplies for the whole crew, but Baron Down said no. And the really interesting aspect of this story is that it introduces some kind of dating app. We see Baron Down open this app that tells him a match is nearby. He can choose the species, arc status, and financial information of the match as well. We have human female, human male, human non-binary, non-human AI, non-human awakened species, other non-specified. So it seems like AI or robots and maybe awakened species of some kind will be possible to maybe romance. I don't know how much this would play in part with the actual romances, but it is a really interesting concept to see a game like this allow you to romance an AI or other non-human species, even going a step further than Mass Effect. It also looks like this datapad was connected via Neuralink. We can see Baron Down's biometrics on the right-hand side. We then see the app cycle through some choices. A non-binary person named Arison, with a date next to their name of 10-27-25-XX. Next, we have Vionica, who looks to be an AI of some sort. I wonder if she is a robot that has been referenced in the game, or if the robots are different from the AI that's mentioned in the dating app. And last up, we have Marietta, which is the girl from the story that made it onto the Ark. The date next to her name is 51125XX. And we can see here that she did not have a spot on the Ark and she did not have money and savings. And we get a little animation with her. And I wonder if this is a cinematic, especially made for this, or if this is an in-game animation. Archetype is also using Unreal Engine 5 for Exodus. And their metahumans have been very beneficial to game development when it comes to creating characters. I also wonder if this Marietta is someone we'll see again. I really do wonder if these character designs will follow through to the final product. We've seen Tom and Max, and while they look to have a similar aesthetic, it's hard to know because we've seen so little of the game and the trailer was obviously a rendered cinematic with little gameplay. And the dates might not be birth dates as 2,500 is roughly 300 years after the rot and 2,200 seems to be when humans were fleeing Earth. Maybe this date is from the date that they signed up on the app or the date that they matched, I'm not sure. And finally, we have the final prologue short story titled Spares. As mentioned in the story about Edith and her daughter Lena, these arcs have passengers in cryosleep who are making the trip to the new world. And then they have the crew that is supposed to remain awake, live out their lives and maintain the ship during the journey. Spares is about one of those crew members named Kendall on the arc The Abandoned Bride. Kendall is a third generation engineer and The Abandoned Bride has seen far better days. 
The story is about Kendall struggling to keep the Ark maintained and having to make some tough decisions. Several of the pods that had people in cryosleep had malfunction and those people had died. Many of the pods had failed and were continuing to have more technical issues. On top of these constant technical issues Kendall was always having to maintain, she herself was feeling unwell, constantly tired with stomach cramps and pain in her hands. So she finally made her way to Med Bay and was checked by an awakened octopus. Nabil 7 had a water-filled tube, part of a network that extended through the entire ship. Nabil 7 could repair drones and help with hard-to-reach places. But octopus don't have very long lives. And when Kendall was first thawed, she started with Nabil 4 and was now on Nabil 7. Through Nabil 7's examination, he tells Kendall that she is suffering from imminent pancreatic failure. His voice translation told her this via the radio translator on her neck after Nabil 7 was typing in his responses with his tentacles. With this bad news, Nabil 7 unthaws a doctor to perform the surgery for her pancreas. When awoken, the surgeon tried printing a biocompatible pancreas for Kendall's transplant. But like the rest of the ship, the printer wasn't working properly. Which brings us to Cryopod 419. Inside was Elanine Hegg, a 28-year-old runner and published poet. She had been accepted to join the ARC for her stellar achievements through their arts and culture program. And her cryopod was at risk of failing any day. So Kendall thought her to take her pancreas. And the accompanying video shows the perspective of Kendall going to the pod to and thaw it. Pretty dire situation. Not only does this lean into the complex moral decision of one versus the many, but it also helps paint the arcs and their situations. Should Kendall live by taking Elanine's pancreas if Elanine was probably going to die in cryo anyways? And if it means Kendall could save the lives of many by her engineer's work on the abandoned bride? It's an interesting moral conundrum. I also wonder if we'll see Kendall again, or again if this is just a story from the past. And since we have a full Exodus timeline, we know that our character, June Aslan, was born in 2476 Lydon era, which is 41,500 AD. Meaning that yes, these stories are seemingly stories from the past of the Arcs when they were originally leaving Earth. But even still, Arcs were still arriving. And a long lost human Arc fleet arrive in the Malakville system and establish the moon on Lydon which is how the story of our character even begins. Our father, Orion Aslan, becomes Lydon's leader after the newly settled human colony struggled for two centuries to survive. His missions to leave the planet and explore space in search of celestial technology to help Lydon helps establish the Aslan dynasty, which seems to be the era the game will take place in. So it seems like the game is taking place during the Aslan dynasty timeline since this is when our protagonist was born. But even still, the arcs are still arriving. So again, these stories about the arcs could be stories from the past. Or I think they could also be arcs that could still play a relevancy to the story. Either way, all of these provide more insight into the society that now existed when the arcs were fleeing Earth. We see the dire situation they were all in and the desperate levels people were going to. I really do wonder if these stories are just stories of the past or if we'll meet these characters later on in the game. Maybe Lena is still in cryo. Maybe Doris the pig is still around. Who knows? But all in all, I'm loving the setting that we're seeing here. It seems dark and complex, and I really want to find out if that dating app is in the game. And more importantly, I want to have a little animal companion, a raccoon buddy, or something of the sort that we can talk to and interact with and maybe have as a crew member. That possibility is really exciting to me. I cannot wait to learn more about this game. I'm not gonna harp on Starfield, but it just wasn't for me. A major aspect of that game that was missing was aliens and the sci-fi aspect that I look for when I think about the concept of humans leaving Earth. I want to see science advance and for alien exploration to be a thing. And I really hope that's something that Exodus leans into. And originally I had said that I think this game might come out at the beginning of 2025 because of the length of their founders program. And that's definitely a possibility, 
but upon double checking, their actual founders program runs until March 31st, 2024. So maybe the game is closer than we think. The December date I originally mentioned seems like the last date you can get the rewards from the Refer a Friend program. But the March date seems to be the date the Founders program actually runs until. So maybe, maybe not. I will say that for a game that might be a ways out, they sure did reveal a lot of information about the protagonist, story, and setting on their website. Another thing I want to bring up that several people mentioned in my first Exodus video, and that's that this companion on the far right looks like this human in this mech suit from the gameplay bit from the trailer. They have the same silhouette, so I definitely think that's the case. People also pointed out that Max looked like she is portrayed by Jessica Parker Kennedy. I think it's her, what do you think? And yes, don't worry, I have a ton of Mass Effect stuff coming, and I also have a video on Humanoid Studio. I'm just a little hyper fixated on this game right now and want people to be excited about it too. And if you've been waiting for their dev answers from their website questionnaire, their community manager replied to me that those answers will be on their social media this week. So hopefully we get some more information soon. In the meantime, if you're interested in Exodus, you can watch my full breakdown and subscribe for more future updates. And be sure to check out their website. There's some really good information there. I will be covering this game pretty closely moving forward. And I will also be covering the Exodus dev answers whenever they release them. But if I don't make another video before Christmas, I hope you all have a great holiday if you celebrate. And thank you so much for all your support this year. And a special thank you to my channel members. Thank you for watching and see you next time.